uh, to be with you tonight. It's good to see uh, a few of you that I recognize. Uh, some of you uh, I don't recognize. Uh, <clears throat> good to see Matt Holman. Where's Matt? I saw him a minute ago. There he is over there. Good to see Matt again. I like the beard. Looks good. I love your dad. I love your brothers. You've got a great family. I don't know whether your dad knows this or not, Matt, but if you talk to him here in the near future, please relay this to him. I was hoping I might run into him here. When we started our church in 1975, we had six people our first service. Myself, my wife, our six-month-old little girl at the time, my mother-in-law, and one other couple. That was the total membership of the Crossroad Baptist Church. And I've said to uh, Bible school uh, young men, seminarians, and Bible students around the country when I've had the privilege of speaking to them, if you want a real challenge, not only will you start a church from scratch, but you'll do it with your mother-in-law. But that dear lady has uh, been a saint in every way, and she's still uh, right there in the saddle with us, serving the Lord 33 years later, and faithful to the Lord. I couldn't have a better mother-in-law. But when we first started the church and we were meeting in an abandoned uh, Church of Christ building, they didn't, uh, they didn't have a choir loft, but they did have a baptistry. So we used the baptistry a lot. But your dad was the very first guest speaker that I ever had fill the pulpit at Crossroad Baptist Church. And I had him come uh, a few times after that, but he was the very first one. I'll never forget that. Uh, Frank Holman, what a great man of God that he is. And your family has been a testimony to thousands of people all over America. I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior when I was five years of age. As my mother, burdened for my soul's salvation, picked me up on her lap and told me the gospel, and I, I, I just didn't have enough sense except to believe what my mother told me. And I accepted Jesus as my Savior and when I was in high school, the sophomore and junior years of high school, I'm not proud to say that I had drifted away from the Lord as a, a teenager. I was not in fellowship with him for that two-year period of time. When I went into the senior year of high school, the summer of that year, a man came to my little town in northern Indiana, a little town by the name of Laporte, Indiana, which is about 30 miles due west of South Bend and about 50 miles due east of Chicago. And he was starting a brand new church. It was called the Faith Baptist Church, and his name was Jack Cox. Jack Cox was a graduate of Midwestern Baptist College, and he was there in Laporte to start that new young church. He's still there at Faith Baptist Church today. He knocked at 308 L Street in LaPorte, Indiana. He told my dad, who answered the door, who he was and what he was doing before he even hardly got the words out of his mouth. My dad looked at him and said, Jack, I am your first member. I have been praying for God to send a soul-winning pastor to LaPorte, Indiana. I'm your first member. My dad was a converted alcoholic. His life story has been played on unshackled all over the world. They had two live tapings of my dad's story. If you listen to that broadcast very often, you no doubt have heard the true life story of Edwin J. Baldwin. Dad was praying for God to send a pastor who believed in soul winning, who was alive and wanted to see people saved in that little town at that point, there wasn't much soul winning going on. So when Jack knocked on 308 L Street, Dad became his first member. Well, Dad started telling me about this new preacher and this new church. And at the time, uh, I really wasn't interested in going to church. Uh, the, the little church that I had been going to was dead as 4 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't want any more part of that. And I figured that's all there was to Christianity, and so I just kind of drifted away. One Saturday afternoon, I was out cutting the grass, and this man walked up to me, and he said, I'm Jack Cox. I'm the pastor that just started the new church, and 
I said, well, my dad's not here right now, but he'll be back in a little while. And he said, I didn't come here to see your dad. I came here to see you. I want you to come and hear me preach. I want you to come and visit my church this Sunday. And he spoke to me with such compassion and, and such sincerity that God spoke to my heart and I kind of said to me, you know, there's something there that you need. And so I, I did go to that next service on Sunday. I went the following Sunday after that and I could not tell you exactly what he preached on. I couldn't tell you the verse. I don't know what he said. But I do know what happened during that invitation when the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of my heart. And he said, Chuck, you've got to make a decision. You're either going to serve me or you're going to serve yourself. You're going to live for, for me or you're going to live for yourself. You've got to make a decision right now, today, to go where, you want, where I tell you to go, to do what I tell you to do, to be what I tell you to be. It's all or nothing right now. You've got to make a decision. We were meeting in a Carpenters Union Hall building that had been converted to a church. Metal chairs were situated at the front that formed the altar. And I remember I put my hands on the, the chair in front of me until my knuckles turned white. And I knew the routine. I figured, well, after two or three verses, it's only a small crowd here, a few people, and nobody's going forward. After a couple of verses, he's going to move on, and this service will be over. And after about the fourth or fifth stanza, the one thing I do remember Jack Cox saying with a high-pitched voice, let's sing another stanza. And I knew God was speaking to me. I walked out of that aisle and I went down to the front. I knelt in front of that metal folding chair that became a holy altar to me. And I told the Lord Jesus Christ that I would do anything he wanted me to do. I would be anything he wanted me to be. I would go anywhere he wanted me to go, that I was his from the crown of my head to the sole of my foot. I meant it when I was an 18-year-old senior in high school. And ladies and gentlemen, I still mean it today. I am the Lord's and he is mine. I had no idea at that time that I would be called into the ministry. I had no idea that came later at a little church in Indiana called the First Baptist Church of Winnemac, Indiana. Brother Larsine Hall was the pastor, and there was a, a BBF evangelist there by the name of uh, Papadopoulos, Bill and Jan Papadopoulos. He called himself the king's trumpeter. His wife played the piano, and he played the trumpet and preached. That's the only time in my life I've ever met him. I've never met him since. I have no idea what happened to him after that night. But he sang and he preached and he gave the invitation and the Lord called me to preach the gospel. And that night I changed all the plans that I had made and went to my pastor and said, where should I go to school? And he said, well, I went to Midwestern Baptist College and he said, it's a good Bible college and it's great for Bible preachers. And he said, I think you ought to go there. Sit under the feet of Tom Malone and hear those men preach. And so I went to Midwestern Baptist College, and that was 1971. I well remember sitting under the feet of Dr. Paul Vanneman. I remember Dr. Herb Noe. I remember Dr. Whitfield. I understand he preached here earlier this week. I remember sitting under the feet of, of Dr. Malone. When I was there, the Sunday School of Manual was running about 4,000, 2,000 on buses and 2,000 walk-in. The, student, the daytime student population of Midwestern Baptist College was right at 300, one semester a little over, one semester a little, a little under. And I tell you, it was a tremendous experience. I met my wife there. She was a Southern Belle from, from Florida, and the first time she opened her mouth and said hello, I fell in love with her. And later on, after two years, we became husband and wife, and then... Uh, don't shoot me, but we transferred to Liberty University in Lynchburg, and I graduated from there two years later. Then went to Pensacola, Florida, and started Crossroad Baptist Church from scratch, as I said a moment ago. I can tell you that all these 33 years, God has been faithful to me. We have three children. Our oldest is a girl. She's married. They have three children. She is our church pianist. Her husband is on our deacon board. He also is our youth leader at the church, our youth minister. All of them are serving the Lord, loving the Lord. Their three children are precious young 
Christian young people. My oldest son, Christopher, owns his own construction business. He has three boys. He's saved. He knows the Lord. His wife is saved, and they're in our church. And he sings in a quartet and teaches uh, in our teaching ministry. His wife is the head of our nursery department, and they're serving in the saddle with us at Crossroad Baptist Church. My youngest son is an attorney. He was with the prosecutor's office for about three years, and then he opened his own law firm, which was what he's doing now. About a year ago, he married the sweetest young Christian lady, and, and they're serving the Lord in our church, and he is our worship leader at Crossroad Baptist Church, and all three of our children are saved, know the Lord, serving God in the saddle with us at Crossroad Baptist Church. And I want to tell you what, being president of the United States does not compare to having God's blessing on your family. I would rather have a Christian family than be president of the United States. And I could not be any more thankful for what God has done for me and for my family. And I thank God for Midwestern Baptist College. I thank God for Tom Malone. I thank God for Jerry Falwell. I thank God for Paul Vanneman and Herbert Noe and all these men that, that I learned so much from as a youth. And I stand before you today as a preacher of the gospel, and I also, of course, am a candidate for president of the United States on the Constitution Party ticket. If you would have ever suggested to me even as a matter of, of six months or so ago, that this would be what I would be doing right now, I would have laughed because I did not think any such thing would be something that I should do. But there's no questioning the will of God. When you know what God's will is, it doesn't matter what other people think, what other people suggest, you have to do what you know God wants you to do. Whether it's conventional or whether people understand it or people think you should do it or not isn't the issue. The only issue is... What does God want me to do? And when I said many years ago that I would do everything that God wanted me to do, I never dreamed that it would entail doing what I'm doing tonight. But I know without any hesitation or reservation that I'm doing what I'm doing in the perfect will of God for my life. Of course, I had to take this not only to my family, but to my church. And I had to present this challenge to them, understanding the hardships and the difficulties that would lie ahead. Understanding the criticism that would come, not only from the unsaved world, but from Christian brethren, from pastors who would criticize, from Christians who would criticize. We could expect that we would be impugned and denigrated in the press, and we have been. We could expect that we would be the butt end of all the jokes on the radio talk show circuit, and we have been. We could fully expect that the people at the gas stations and the shopping centers would snicker and laugh and make fun, not just of me and my family, but also of the members of our church. Who is this idiot? What does he think he's doing that he's a candidate for president of the United States? Don't you know that if you're not a Republican or if you're not a Democrat, nobody else is eligible to run, nobody else is qualified to run? Don't you know it's a lost cause and it's hopeless? What in the world is he doing? What are you trying to do? And why would you go to such a church as that? And I heard one radio talk show host say publicly to the community in our area, why don't those members over there at Crossroad Baptist Church fire that idiot? Well, we talked about that. And I asked the church for their approbation, whether or not they felt that this is what God would have to me to do. And I stood there in front of my congregation as man after man after man and woman after woman after woman stood and encouraged me and said, Pastor, if this is what God has called you to do, we are behind you all of the way. You do what God would have you to do. And you don't worry about the insults. You don't worry about the talk. We'll take care of that. You just do what God would have you to do. And I'm happy to report today that not only in spite of all the criticisms and all of, the, of those things that have taken place over the last five or six months, not only has, has our church stood together, but we have seen God bless our church with many people saved and many new families coming to our church. And our church has grown more in the last five months since I've been a candidate for president than we have in the last couple of years before that time. God has made it very abundantly clear that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in 2008. Our, church, our country was founded on three essential documents. It was founded upon the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. The principles of our founding documents create an independent and limited government that recognize the authority of man's creator and our ultimate submission to him. Every once in a while, I'll hear somebody say, 
Well, what we have to do is we just have to elect more Christians to public office. We need to elect Christian congressmen, Christian president, Christian senators. The only problem with that is I notice that just about every politician becomes a Christian at least every four years. If electing Christians was the answer to our problems, then I ask why in the world are we in the condition that we are in today? When's the last time you've ever had a politician come to your church or come to your office as a pastor and say, I'm here running for such and such an office. Please vote for me. I'm an atheist. Please vote for me. I'm an agnostic. Please vote for me. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Bible. They all say they believe in God. They all say they believe the Bible. They all say they, they belong to, to churches and are Christians. And many of them are members of churches in our communities. If electing professing Christians was the answer, then we would not be having the problem that we're having in our country today. Obviously, there's something more to it than that. Our country was established as a nation under God. Our country was established as a nation that understood that it was man's creator that gave us our freedoms and our liberties. That freedom and liberty is a gift of God, as Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence. It's not something that we manufacture. It's not something that we create. It's not something that our armies can go out and purchase for us. There have been many brave men that have given their lives on the field of battle, but their countries fell into servitude and oppression. There have been many that have fought the good fight of courage and have risked their lives and have given their lives on the battlefield, but those countries have still gone into slavery and servitude. It's not the armies of America that have made America free as much as we appreciate the sacrifice of our armed forces. But it's not the Army and Navy and Marines and Air Force that have made America free. It is God that has made America free. Liberty is the gift of God, just as life is the gift of God. And the United States of America is the only nation in the history of the world that is codified in our founding documents the sacred principles upon which the Word of God has taught us and has proclaimed these things to us. For example, the Declaration of Independence, paragraph 1, says, the laws of nature and of nature's God. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson was not a born-again Christian, as I understand it. I've done a lot of research into our, our founding fathers. I'm not convinced that he knew the Lord as, as we know the Lord. I understand that there were things about his theology that make him suspect in my mind pertaining to his, his, uh, his doctrine. But Thomas Jefferson, as unskilled in the Word of God as he may have been, understood enough about natural law. He had, he had heard from the writings of, of Calvin. He had heard from the writings of John Locke. He had read Blackstone. He understood what all of our founders understood, that there was a natural law, that there was an innate law that God had given into the hearts of men about basic goodness and basic morality, basic right and basic wrong. They understood that all of, of nature was dependent upon the laws of nature and of nature's God. And so, yes, he begins to write the Declaration of Independence, our very cornerstone document, the birth certificate of America. In the first paragraph, he says the laws of nature and of nature's God. Well, of course, William Blackstone was the authority in the legal profession throughout the first 150 years of American jurisprudence. All of our lawyers and attorneys studied at the feet of Blackstone. His commentaries on the law were the authority in the manual of law for at least up until the war between the states. William Blackstone wrote this, man considered as a creature must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator for he is entirely a dependent being. And consequently, as man depends absolutely upon his maker for everything, it is necessary that he should at all points conform to his maker's will. For the first time in history, for the first time in history, a nation inculcated the creator's will for the government of mankind into its founding documents. Ladies and gentlemen, this has never happened before in the history of the world. And if something happens to the United States of America and we lose our constitutional republic, it will never happen again. Therefore, it doesn't really matter whether a politician, whether he claims to be a Christian or whether he's a Baptist or a Catholic, whatever his particular denomination might be, 
What matters is that he supports, protects, and defends the Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights, because it's these documents that have inculcated into our nation the maker's will for our government. I have said this, and I've had a lot of Christians that have raised an eyebrow when I said it, but I'll say it here in front of this audience. I would rather elect an unbeliever who will support, protect, and defend the Constitution than a believer who will not support, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The oath of office to the Constitution is the contract that every elected office holder makes with we, the people. And under our form of government, do we not understand that it is we, the people, through our Constitution, that is the supreme law of the land? We do not have a monarchy in these United States. We do not have a king in this country. I hear people talk about Romans chapter 13, how that we are to be subject unto the, uh, the higher powers, the powers that be ordained of God, and I believe that as much as any man. And I hear people say to me, well, what that means is, therefore, we're supposed to do whatever the president says to do. We're supposed to do whatever the Supreme Court says to do, no matter what it is, how egregiously wrong or sinful it might be, no matter how wicked it might be. We're supposed to submit because that's what Romans 13 says. Oh, but we don't have a king in America. This is a constitutional republic where we, the people, rule through our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. We uh, we allow people to become lawmakers and, and elected office holders under the contract that they make with us called the Constitution of the United States. When they break their, constr uh, their contract with us, it is our responsibility to do what we would do as any faithful employer would do when he has an unruly employee. It is our job to fire them. Unfortunately, what we've been doing over the years is we've been going to the polls and we've been electing people because they're a Democrat or because they're Republican, because of their title or because of their profession, and they, we allow them to break the contract with us with impunity. We allow them to lie to us. We allow them to deceive us. We allow them to shred the Constitution, the very contract they make with us, time and time again. And we do not hold them accountable as if we have no power at all at our disposal. But we are not subjects of a king except King Jesus. When the Revolutionaries fought that war for independence. There was a motto in that war. If you've studied your history, you know about this. Most wars have a motto. We all remember the war for Texas independence. Remember the Alamo? Remember the, the motto for World War I, making the world safe for democracy? There was a motto at the Revolutionary War, and the motto was, no king but Jesus. And our brave Christian ancestors gave their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to the defense of the fact that there would be no king in America except Jesus Christ. That only Christ could rule and reign in the heart of conscience and in the heart of soul in a man. And that there was no man, there was no group of men, there was no Congress, there was no king, there was no monarchy that had the right to dictate religion and religious expression to the people of the United States of America. And that is what America was founded on. And now here, these 200 plus years later, we are willing to surrender back to the same kind of unlawful authority that we broke free from 200 years ago because we are unwilling to exercise that, that contract that we have with our elected office holders, which is namely the Constitution of the United States. Have you read the Declaration of Independence lately? In paragraph two, it says that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, George Washington were not evolutionists. They were creationists. They believed that God created us, that he made us. If you were to ask the average American today, Christian or not, where do we get our rights? Most of them would probably say from government. But that's not true. According to our founding documents, we received our rights the same place we received our life from, from our creator. It is God that gives us our rights. It is the responsibility of government, according to the Declaration of Independence, to secure these rights. There's only one purpose for lawful government, only one. It's not to make up rules for us that we cannot follow in good conscience. 
It's not to dictate to our hearts and to our lives what they say is right and what is wrong. It's not to give us some politically correct dogma that we must comply with or find ourselves at odds with our, with our governing officials. It is the responsibility of civil government to secure the rights that have been given to us by our Creator. And our founders understood this. To a, to a man, they understood it. To a woman, they understood it. And they pledged their lives, and they did pledge their fortunes, and they did pledge their sacred honors for the purpose of maintaining that principle that they would be allowed to be free men and women and that only Christ would be their sovereign, no king, over their hearts. Jefferson went on to say that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, this is all part of natural law. Jefferson said the laws of nature and nature's God four times in the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson refers and invokes the name of God four times in our nation's birth certificate. Natural law. Well, if you read your Bible, natural law is found in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, isn't it? The law of God written in their hearts. That God is the giver of life is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. That God grants liberty is found in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. The pursuit of happiness is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 13. Even the Constitution, I hear people say, well, the Constitution is a secular document. No mention of, of God in the Constitution. Oh, really? When's the last time you read the Constitution? Not lately, I presume. Article 1, Section 7, Paragraph 2. If any bill shall not be returned by the President within 10 days, parenthesis, still quoting, Sundays accepted, close quote, the U.S. Constitution exempts Sunday as a legal business day. Sunday, the Christian day of worship. The Constitution recognizes the Christian day of worship as being a sacred day and exempts government business from being transacted. Article 7 of the Constitution states, now listen very carefully, the concluding paragraph of the Declaration, uh, excuse me, of the Constitution. Quote, done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord. 1,787 and the independence of the United States, America the 12th. Close quote. In the year of our Lord. The Constitution of the United States of America declares the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our country. I heard Brother Mike Huckabee, I think he, was, I think he meant well and when he was on the campaign trail running for president, but he said a very foolish thing in my view. He got up and told the American press, he said, if I'm President of the United States, I would like to draft a constitutional amendment to incorporate the laws of God into our, uh, the, the fabric and the fiber of our national documents. And of course, the liberal media had a field day with that, but I, I stood up when I heard it. I was sitting down and I, I said, Brother Mike, do you not understand that the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, and the Bill of Rights is the codification of God's law in the United States of America that we have already through natural law and the precepts thereby inculcated in our own country's founding documents that which we need to govern ourselves according to the laws of nature and of nature's God. You don't have to create a new document. You don't have to create a new constitutional amendment. All we need to do is expect and insist that those who take the oath of office will do what they say they will do and uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. Why, the Bill of Rights itself is replete with the laws of nature and nature of God. The First Amendment itself, which grants every one of us the right of religious liberty, is a part of natural law. First Amendment protects the right of men to peaceably assemble, freedom of the speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. The very First Amendment. I'm sure some of you in this audience, if not most of you, are un uh, you understand the background of the First Amendment, do you not? Do you not understand that if it was not for a Baptist pastor by the name of John Leland, we would not even have a First Amendment? 
Do you not understand that whenever our country was first being formed and our Constitution was being drafted, that there was a great skepticism surrounding this new document called the Constitution for fear that it might centralize too much power into the hands of a, of a federal force and not protect the rights of individuals and the freedoms of individuals? We had just fought a bloody revolutionary war. We had just lost many of our homes and our children and our lives in the, in the fight for independence. Now were we going to give it back all to an all-powerful federal government? Already in Virginia, the Anglicans who were in control of the government were persecuting Baptists because they would not submit to the dogma of the Anglican Church. They controlled the hierarchy of government at the state and the local levels in Virginia. And Baptists, our Baptist forebears in Virginia, preaching the gospel, baptizing by immersion the converts that were coming out of the Anglican churches. And whenever the Anglicans found out that they were baptizing by immersion, would not accept the, the infant baptism and the sprinkling of the Anglicans, and were preaching doctrines contrary to the Anglican theology, they coerced the civil magistrates of, of Virginia to persecute the Baptist preachers in that colony, and our Baptist granddaddies were beaten and jailed and persecuted for preaching the same gospel that we preach every Sunday in our pulpits throughout this country. And John Leland came to James Madison, the father of our Constitution, and said to him, Mr. Madison, we will not support a declaration, uh, excuse me, a Constitution if it does not include among the Bill of Rights, the very first one must be the freedom of religion so that no man or no group of men will have the power in America to force us to preach the way they want us to preach or to believe the way they want us to believe or to baptize the way they want us to baptize. We will be free men in America or we will never accept this new government. James Madison was moved with Leland's persistence and with his, his impassioned pleas he said to Leland, I promise you, you support me. I will be sure that we have a, a declaration of, of human rights, a declaration of liberty for individuals. We will call it the Bill of Rights. And the very first one will be the freedom of religion. Every man and woman and child in this country today owes their religious liberty to a Baptist pastor. And if it takes a Baptist pastor in 2008 to help preserve that same liberty, so be it. It's a part of natural law. What about the Second Amendment? I'm glad you ask. Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 11, verse 21, when a strong man armed, did you catch that? When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. I know Jesus told Peter to put up his sword, but he did not tell him to give up his sword. In fact, on another occasion, he said, if you don't have a sword, sell what you have and buy one. The old first century Roman sword was the equivalent of a modern day handgun that you might buy at your local sporting goods store. Now, I don't know about you, but I'll take the word of Jesus over the word of Hillary Clinton any day. It's a part of natural law. The Fourth Amendment that protects us against unreasonable searches and seizures. A, a, an amendment, by the way, that our current federal government is, is, uh, is abridging and eviscerating with impunity. The Patriot Act is nothing more than an act of tyranny against the Fourth Amendment. And I don't hear Republicans, Democrats, or even Christians and pastors standing up and speaking out for freedom on these issues that are so near and dear to us as Christians in this country. The Fourth Amendment is found in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 and 11. The Eighth Amendment is found in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Even our three co-equal branches of government are patterned after the three positional offices of Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 22. I say all that to say this. We don't need men and women who give lip service to religious profession. I could care less whether they say they're a Christian or a Baptist. 
We need men and women who will support, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And when we look at the way that our elected leaders are betraying our Constitution, are betraying our very form of government, not to mention the Christian values upon which our country was built, it is absolutely shameful and despicable that we who call ourselves Christians and we who call ourselves men of God in the pulpits would sit back and let it happen. God help us. Our Christian faithful men in the pulpits of yesteryear stood up. I've read so many. I've read scores and scores of the preacher's sermons back in the 1700s as they stood in front of their congregations and told their people of freedom and independence and liberty and how that we had a responsibility to God and how that this was for our posterity and our children. I've, heard, I've, heard, I've had pastors say to me, I've had Christians say to me, well, we're not supposed to get involved. We're just supposed to preach the gospel, do nothing else. Okay, then don't you dare, don't you dare celebrate Independence Day on the 4th of July. Don't you dare have a patriotic service on the Sunday before the 4th of July and get up and talk about how wonderful it is to have America and how wonderful it is to have the, the, the Declaration of Independence and, and celebrate the signing of that Declaration of Independence and celebrate the formation of these United States of America. How that we ought to so to be free and independent states. Men who risked their lives and went into rebellion against the king in order to give to their posterity freedom and liberty. Liberty to preach the gospel. Liberty to send missionaries around the world. Liberty to do what this church has done for years and print gospel literature to all places throughout the world. Liberty! You know, the only thing we're supposed to do is preach the gospel. We don't have a responsibility to our children to preserve liberty and freedom. We don't have a responsibility to stand and protect those very sacred documents that, upon which our freedoms are, are built and without whom our freedoms will collapse. I don't know about you. I have three children, six grandchildren so far. Would I want them to stand in front of a firing squad? And would I want them to remain faithful to Jesus Christ instead of taking the easy way out and denying Christ? Would I, would I want them to be faithful to the Lord in, in, in spite of persecution, famine, and sword? Would I, would I want them to hold their head high and proclaim Jesus if it meant they were burned at the stake? Well, for thousands of years before America was ever formed, that's exactly what our forebears were doing. They were preaching the gospel. They were doing what we do every Sunday, every day of the week. But they paid for it with their lives. They paid for it with their death. They paid for it with severe, intense persecution. And I like to think that I would stand in that kind of a, a, a environment and be faithful to Christ. Of course I would like to think that I would do that. Would I want my children to stand faithful to Christ in that environment? Of course I would want them to do that. But in God's name... Would I desire that my children have to go through that if it could be prevented? We in these United States of America have a responsibility to bequeath to our children the same freedom that we have been given. And if we don't do it, freedom shall pass in this country. I know God is still God. I know Christ is still Christ. I know the Bible is still the Bible. And I know that the church can thrive in persecution. But do we really intend that our children should endure persecution when we have the power to stop it? When we have the power to preserve the freedoms and the liberties that we've enjoyed through all these years? Can we not see the handwriting on the wall? Can we not see the ominous clouds of foreboding all around us? Can we not identify with Patrick Henry who said they're already in the streets? What are you talking about? Men desire peace and safety. You want to turn your back and pretend that nothing is happening. We are losing our Christian liberties. We're losing our Christian culture. We're losing the, the very values and principles upon which our country was built. We're even losing our very independence. Both John McCain and Barack Obama are out there on the campaign trail promoting globalism and, and universalism. 
John McCain says with the first year he's elected president, he's going to create a new league of democracies, which is nothing more than the United Nations on steroids. Go read the document, don't take my word for it. Go to the CFR webpage and read it for yourself. He stood in front of the Hoover Institution a few months ago and said he would do it just a few days ago in this debate with Barack Obama. He repeated it, I'm going to start a league of democracies. President Bush has signed the SPP, Security and Prosperity Partnership, an agreement with Mexico and Canada that surrenders our sovereignty and our national autonomy to an international agency. These international global institutions, and now, we're, now we are surrendering our very economy and our very money supply and our financial institutions to global institutions and to global entities, nationalizing our very financial institutions being run by bankers who mostly come from Europe, mostly come from other parts of the world. They're not Americans. They have no loyalty to the United States of America. They have no desire for the peace and prosperity of the United States of America. They're only in it for themselves. And we have turned the entire economy of the United States of America over to a cabal of international banksters that instead if our president of the United States would be facing jail time for committing fraud against the American people. But these two political parties have allowed to sell our country our sovereignty to keep our borders wide open while we take our troops over to Iraq to guard the borders of Iraq. We leave our own borders wide open and unprotected. I just came from the border not too many weeks ago. As bad as you might think it is, it is ten times worse than that. And yet, George W. Bush, John McCain, Barack Obama, none of them have any intention on securing our country's borders. Don't tell me we're fighting a war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan when we won't even secure our own country's borders. Ronald Reagan said a nation without borders is not a nation. And ladies and gentlemen, he's right. We are a nation without borders today in these United States of America. What about the right to life, the most precious gift of all from God? We believe that every unborn child is a human being created in the image of God and should be protected by law in this country. And yet from 2000 to 2006, a supposed pro-life president and a supposed pro-life Congress and a supposed pro-life Senate sat back, controlled the entire federal government for six long years and not one unborn baby's life was saved. When George W. Bush took office in January 2001, over one million unborn babies were being murdered in the wombs of their mothers. And when George W. Bush leaves office in January 2009, over one million babies are being born in the wombs of their mothers every year. Oh, if we could only get the point, we're going to get the right justices on the court. Do you know that Republicans have been appointing the majority of the court ever since 1973 when Roe v. Wade was passed? The current court right now is configured 7-2 in favor of Republican appointments. Republicans are just as culpable in giving us these, these justices who are legislating from the bench as our Democrats. John McCain is going to give us good judges. Oh, really? You mean like Ruth Bader Ginsburg? John McCain voted for her. ACU lawyer Ruth Bader Ginsburg, John McCain voted for her. You mean Stephen Breyer, liberal pro-abortion Supreme Court justice, John McCain voted for her, for him, excuse me. What's happened is these politicians are using us as Christians for fodder. They come and give us rhetoric every two years when they're running for, re for election. And then after they're elected, they go to Washington, D.C., and they laugh at us, and they ignore every promise they made. And until we Christians and we pastors are willing to see through it and to stand up to those that are doing this and proclaim what is right and demand that they uphold their oath to the Constitution and hold their feet to the fire, there will be no change in America. This bailout that I just referred to a minute ago, somebody said this is nothing more than Robin Hood in reverse, taking from the poor and giving to the rich. Uh, let me just close with this. One of my favorite characters of, of American history is Daniel Webster. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. I'm going to give you a couple quotes. 
from this celebrated jurist, maybe America's most celebrated jurist, Christian dedicated believer. Webster said, hold on my friends to the Constitution and to the Republic for which it stands. Listen carefully. Miracles do not cluster. And what has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution. For if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. He also said, the hand that destroys the Constitution rends our union asunder forever. Now please keep those words in mind and listen to Webster when he said this. If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we in our posterity neglect its instruction and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. You see, Daniel Webster, like most of America's founders, was a man with deeply held Christian convictions. He believed the Bible, he was a devout believer, and he found no contradictions between the Bible and the Constitution. In fact, he believed that the Constitution was the best safeguard to Christian liberty that we have. And so it is. Adherence to constitutional government is that which protects everything, everything we hold dear as Americans. If God smiles miraculously on this campaign, I will, on January 20th, 2009, raise one hand to heaven and another hand on an open Bible and swear before God and the American people that I will do one thing. And this is the same oath that every president, every congressman, every senator, every county commissioner will take next January. That I will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And it's up to us. It's up to you. It's up to you, pastor. It's up to you, deacon. It's up to you, Sunday school teacher. It's up to you, Christian layman, to make sure that every single elected office holder honors their word and upholds the Constitution. That is my platform. That is my message that I'm taking all across these United States. I've gone from California to Washington, D.C., from Washington State to South Carolina and all parts in between. And I'm going to be working between now and November the 4th doing the same thing. It's the same message. I truly believe with all of my heart and every fiber of my being Judgment must begin at the house of God. And until the Christians and the pastors of America begin to awaken, awaken to the principles of religious freedom, awaken to the principles of constitutional government, awaken to the principles upon which our country was built, and holding accountable those who want to be our nation's civil magistrates, until we, the church, begin doing this, there is no hope for this country. And we will continue the slippery slide into tyranny and globalism and corporatism and every other kind of evil-ism, and it will not matter whether it is a Democrat or a Republican who's at the helm. The church, the 
church holds the key to America's future, just as it did 200 years ago. Thank you very much for your willingness to allow me to come and be part of this fellowship. Thank God for the memory of Tom Malone, and thank God for Midwestern Baptist College, and thank God for all of you. I just ask, if nothing else, would you please pray for me as I take this message across America. Thank you.